Hey guys, Kenny here. So today we're going to look a little bit at the history of conservation and public land. And when we start thinking about affluence and poverty, we start thinking about what, what we own. And it's an interesting concept to start realizing and thinking about when you start realizing that we have this investment as a country and other countries have this too in their own uh, borders. But this idea of shared lands or public lands that are available to access by everyone. So let's go ahead and take a look at essential questions for this uh, set of notes and we'll go from there. So number one, what is the relationship between the system and surroundings? This is something that comes up a lot in things like physics when we start looking at energy flow and thermodynamics, uh, but how does the system and surroundings concept relate to what we're doing here in environmental science and how do they impact each other? Number two, what are the two types of resources and how are they different? This will be a recurring theme that we'll start seeing throughout the course of this class. Number three, what are public lands and how does this relate to the tragedy of the commons? Remember the tragedy of the commons is what we talked about when we were listening to a bee's invoice. And number four, who are the two individuals who impacted land management in the US and explain their perspective with respect to preservation and conservation, okay? So there are lots of people who played a huge role in the development of our national public land system. I mean, it really is a big list, but there are two people that in my mind end up playing a central role in establishing the public lands concept that we have here in the United States. All right, so let's go ahead and start by taking a look at this concept of system and surroundings. Now, a system is a collection of all the variables that we are observing, a set of components that interact in a what we would consider, consider a closed unit. The surroundings are all the components or variables that are outside of that unit, but they can still possibly affect the system and often do. Remember, nothing exists in a vacuum. And so when we start looking at this relationship of system and surroundings, we usually talk about it in terms of, you know, making a diagram. Um, maybe you guys have done uh, Venn diagrams or something of the sort before. So I want to kind of paint you a picture really quickly. When we start thinking about a system, maybe I can draw it here in this corner. If I create a circle here, this represents the system and all the things that go on inside that system. Outside of that is the surroundings. And usually we talk about energy flow within a closed system, but oftentimes we get energy from the surroundings or give energy to the surroundings. And so there is this interaction between the system and the surroundings that we have to go ahead and account for, because again, remember, nothing exists in a vacuum. Okay. All right, so let's talk about these two terms that are commonly confused. Affect versus effect. So to affect is to influence a system. An effect is the result of that influence to a system. So the whole reason we're studying environmental science today is because there has been an adverse effect by the effective population on our environment. Okay. Now, this next slide, I, some of you may argue with me and okay, but I really believe that in order for us to be utilizing science correctly, this has to be true. Science is non-political. Science is based on observations and scientific law. It is not coming in, in the best of cases, with any preconceived notions about what should or shouldn't happen. And doesn't think about it in terms of my personal stake. This, however, is where we have to be a little careful because this is where we take that term from last class, bias. Now, it's almost impossible to be, impossible to be totally free from bias, but we try in science to be as unbiased as possible. The environmental movement is a scientific movement dedicated to the study of the environment and the effects of population on that environment. Environmentalism is a social movement dedicated to the protection of the environment. So 
they're not the same, the environmental movement and environmentalism. They often have common goals, but they aren't the same thing. So as we go ahead and start looking at the use of resources and things along these lines, we have to realize that environmentalism and environmental movement have some common goals, but the process by which they achieve those goals is not necessarily the same. So what's a resource? Now we've talked kind of around this term as we've gone through, but let's be very explicit in it. A resource is anything from the environment that meets a need. So we categorize these into three groups. We have perpetual resources, one that's renewed continuously. We don't have to worry about it degrading or disappearing. And so the only real example of this I can think of is solar energy. We have renewable resources, one that can be replenished fairly easily and rapidly as long as we care for it properly. And then we have our non-renewable resources, those that exist in a fixed amount and once they're used, they're gone. So keeping these terms in mind, and these are important terms, how do we use resources? Well, if we keep in mind that sustainable model that we've been talking about, the use of resources is best when it, it's mostly sustainable. Okay? And we can't go over the level at which the renewable resources can be replenished. Because if we go beyond that, we will not be able to keep up with the demand. Supply will not match it. And this is an important economic concept, this idea of supply equaling demand. Um, because we get more and more people, bigger and bigger population, more people consuming more things, we're starting to tax those renewable resources in a way that they cannot regenerate fast enough to provide for all of the demand. So this is where we get to environmental degradation. This occurs when the use rate exceeds the replacement rate. Now let's take a look at some renewable versus non-renewable resources. So when we talk about renewable, most of what we're gonna be talking about is going to be wind, tides, flowing water, uh, direct solar. This is in juxtaposition with the non-renewable resources of fossil fuels, metallic minerals, iron, copper, aluminum, so on and so forth, and our non-metallic -metal minerals, sand, clay, phosphate, so on and so forth. We do have some other resources that could be renewable, fresh air, fresh water, fertile soil, biodiversity, um, but it depends again on how we use them. So again, let's take a look at our non-renewable resources. Non-renewable resources are those that run out. Um, they exist in a fixed quantity in the Earth's crust and can be used up. The first thing that comes to mind, hopefully, is your minerals, uh, usually hard crystalline materials formed naturally. And reserves are those deposits from which a usable mineral can be profitably extracted at current prices. Now, we'll ha we would normally go ahead and talk about this at the ending of this term, beginning of next term. But this is one section that's probably going to be eliminated due to time constraints of distance learning. Okay, so it's good that we talk about this right now. Now, who owns these resources? Do you own them? Do I own them? Does the government own them? Property rights give ownership to all the resources on the property. So if you own your house, any resources that are in the land or under the land of the house that you own are yours. Common property or free access resources are those resources that are not owned and available for use by everyone. Good examples of this include the air, the ocean. There is no one single person or group of people that owns that. They're considered common property. And this is where we start running into the issue of the tragedy of the commons. Do you remember watching the video on a bee's invoice? We start looking at common pool resources and if we exploit them, and we overuse these natural resources because of either unclear property rights or because they are common pool and hard to limit. If we don't have established ownership, everyone has a, an incentive to take as much as possible, as quickly as possible, before it's gone. And a good example of this is the decline in the fish population resulting from overfishing in the ocean. And we'll talk more about this when we get to our food unit pretty soon. 
which brings up this idea of public lands and ownership. Um, in the last few years, the term public lands has been spoken about with increasing regularity. You've likely seen it in news articles, documentaries, even in advertising. But what exactly are public lands? Well, in the broadest sense of the term, there are areas of land that are open to the public and managed by our government. You can think of it as land you own and share with everyone else in the United States. There are different roles that the government plays depending on where you're at. Um, we typically look at three types of government. We have federal lands, those that are controlled by the entire United States. We have state lands that are owned and controlled by the state. And then you have local lands that are owned and controlled by local counties, cities, so on and so forth. Now, you have to keep this in mind because public lands are not just our national parks, but your state and local city parks also count in this category. And there's a difference among them in terms of how they function and how you have property rights to them. Federal public lands are held in trust for all Americans, and the goal is to manage the land for the long-term health of both the land and the people that want to visit it. So I want to give you some time to look at some maps really quickly, and we can start taking a look at how this land is distributed. The first one I want to go ahead and show you here is Protected Areas Database um, from U.S. Geological Survey. Now, what I want to highlight is you see all those brightly colored areas. Most of the public lands in the United States, not all, but many of them are in the western United States. And part of that is because people started using up a lot of those resources before they thought about protecting them. And this is what happened to a lot of Europe. And a lot of Europe has uh, many of their resources used up um, to a point where they're, they weren't worth protecting or they were very going to be difficult to protect for whatever reason. And so in the United States, you can see that uh, Hawaii and Alaska and the western United States have far more of these protected areas than much of the rest of the country. Now, for your purposes, it's probably more valuable to take a look at Oregon's distribution of land. And this is interesting because we start looking at the balance of public versus private here. And I highlight burns on this map because I'd originally pulled this up when I was looking at the Malheur standoff that occurred in 2016, which was looking at the interface and what were the rights in terms of public lands. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But when we start looking at the lands owned and managed, I should say, by the federal property or other um, entity, we start realizing the Federal Bureau of Land Management is that color here. There's a lot in the southeastern portion of the state. Um, this tends to be the drier section. As you move towards the less left side of the map, you see all that kind of patchiness. You see, see a combination of state lands. Oregon actually did pretty well in trying to protect and preserve a lot of its uh, natural habitat. And there's an interesting little white square there down. That's actually none of those that belongs to the National Park Service, and that's Crater Lake National Park, and so um, that could fall under the federal lands as well. Let's zoom in just a little bit more and take a look at land distribution here in Eugene. Um, you can see here there's distribution of land, a lot of it being uh, set aside for private. I mean, you can probably find the general area where your house is. There's a lot of neighborhoods in Eugene proper. Uh, but there are definitely sections that belong to the state, whether it's fish and wildlife or parks and rec. Um, we have some that are part of <clears throat> National uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. We have some that are uh, BLM. We have some that are National Park Service, Forest Service. There's, there's a lot of different uh, properties in and around this particular area. And hopefully, as you get in this close, you're starting to realize there are some weird things about this. A lot of it has these weird little checkerboards. And that's because when they originally sold off these lands, they were sold in parcels, or gave them away in some cases. And so depending on who bought it or how it came into the you know, public domain, um, they were alternating squares. And this was to help keep things balanced and even in terms of ownership originally. But it makes for hard protection 
of areas that are fragmented like that. So if you have an endangered species or if you have a particular watershed that you're trying to protect, that kind of patchwork stuff is really difficult to go ahead and manage. Now I wanted to throw some numbers at you. Um, this is the U.S. lands total, uh, how much our federal government kind of owns. Uh, we are managing yeah, 640 million acres that are federally managed as part of the U.S. land. Now, there are four major agencies within the United States that do most of the management. The biggest of these is the BLM, not Black Lives Matter, but Bureau of Land Management. Uh, then we have the USFS, or United States Forest Service. USFWS, uh, this is United States Fish and Wildlife Service. And then the NPS, which is the National Park Service, which manages our uh, national parks, monuments, etc. Okay. I throw this in because this is one that I found to be really representative to kind of illustrate in a better way what I tried to show you on that federal map earlier. Uh, what it looks at is how much of the land as a percentage of total land area in the state is federal protected lands. And so you can see uh, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, everything from there west has a huge portion of the state's land um, protected and managed by our federal government. And so that's very different from what you see on the East Coast. And in fact, in places like New Jersey, there's little to none. Okay. New Jersey has 3%, you have 2% there in Delaware, Rhode Island is looking at like 0.4%. So there's very little public lands in terms of federal holdings as you head farther and farther east. <clears throat> now, each of these federal agencies has different objectives and policies for the ways in which they take care of that land. Within the national park system alone, there are 28 designations. And I'm not going to go into all the different details of all those different designations, but here's a really quick kind of primer on the types of public lands you're most likely to encounter. We have national parks, national trails, national forests, national recreation areas, wild and scenic rivers, national conservation lands, national monuments, state parks, city parks, and wildernesses. And so these are all different in terms of how we utilize them. And I hope that you guys will take advantage of your public lands and utilize them because that's really what they're there for. But while you're there, also take care of them. And one of the things that I always like to highlight at this point in time is National Public Lands Day. Uh, for this year, in 2021, that is going to be September 25th. And it's a day that your national parks and many of your state parks are actually free. Uh, you don't have to pay to get into them. And the idea is that you get out, you enjoy them, and you like them enough to either come back when they're not free or to go ahead and donate your time to help care for those lands. So let's go ahead and take a look at this really quick. If I can get the video to load, hopefully it'll send it. Happy National Public Lands Day! Happy National Public Lands Day! Happy National Public Lands Day!
right. Take right. take two. Okay, so I hope you appreciate that there is an opportunity here to take some action and do something to help protect our public lands. Now, as we start talking about this, what's better for the environment, public lands or private lands? Who do you think takes better care of our shared spaces? Remember when we were talking about McDonaldization and this idea of the irrationality of rationality. Um, is it possible to move too much towards efficiency to the point where we're no longer getting the job done of what we're hoping to do with it? Do people always make the best decisions for themselves? What about for others? And then go ahead and remember our definition for sustainability from earlier on in the term. Now, before we kind of close out and look a little bit at conservationism and the history of the National Park Service, I want to talk to you really briefly about nature deficit disorder. And I think this has become an increasing problem, especially because of the pandemic. Co-founder and author Richard Liu introduced the term nature deficit disorder in 2005 with the publication of his best-selling book, Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. He coined the phrase to serve as a description of the human cost of alienation from nature. So what is nature deficit disorder? It's the idea that human beings, especially children, are spending less and less time outdoors, and the belief that this change is resulting in a wide range of behavior problems. Do you think this is a real thing? Pause the video here and think about it. So what'd you come up with? Well, it's not meant to be a medical diagnosis, although maybe it should be. Um, this disorder is not recognized by any of the medical manuals for mental disorders such as the ICD-10 or the DSM-5. Um, and he's written books since then kind of revisiting this question, like The Nature Principle, Reconnecting with Life in a Virtual Age, which extends the conversation to include adults and explore the key question what could our lives and our children's lives be like if our days and nights were immersed in nature rather than in technology? And I think if you go back to these early conservationists and preservationists, um, that was a real thing for them, being part and at one with the environment around them. Preservationists saw wilderness as being lost to private exploitation. People could make money chopping down the trees, building hotels. Um, and they argued that the government should step in and act to reserve portions of the public domain to assure that present and future generations would have the opportunity to observe virgin forests, mountain meadows, and other features of nature. Some, such as John Muir, who's one of those big guys I was talking about, argued that nature had a right to exist that was independent of society's needs. Nature was here before us, and therefore it had a right to exist, and not only exist, but to Thrive. And he went to great lengths uh, working with such people as Theodore Roosevelt. Now, President Teddy Roosevelt was a famous naturalist. Uh, he was a big hunter and outdoorsman and part of the Rough Riders, and he loved the American West. And the two made a great team, if at first unlikely. Um, Muir was particularly interested in the mountains of California and Alaska, but it ended up that he protected a whole bunch and helped to set up many of our national park lands, and he became the first president of the Sierra Club. The progressive conservation movement led by Roosevelt, Fernow, Gifford Pinchot, and most of the federal scientific establishment attempted to bring about efficient use of natural resources through large-scale management systems directed by professional resource specialists. So here's kind of the list that I typically think of when I think of these progressive conservationists. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, obviously, uh, John Leslie Powell, who was a great explorer of Western rivers, G Gifford Pinchot, uh, who was a politician and forester, and even Stephen Mather. He's an industrialist and millionaire, but he turned out to be a huge conservationist who was really a pushing force behind the development of the National Park Service. And there are even stamps that is John Wesley Powell going down uh, the Desolation Canyon. So and so I don't want to spend a lot of time going over these. You can pause it as you go through. But these, in my mind, are the major U.S. legislations uh, that went ahead and led to our current situation with respect to protecting 
the creation of the BLM, 1785, Department of Interior, 1849, uh, Department of Agriculture, 1862, uh, Fishing Commission, 1871, USGS in 1879, uh, Division of Forestry, 1881, uh, Forest Reserve Act is passed for the first national forest, 1891, first wildlife refuge is 1903, US Forest Service is uh, 1905, Passage of the Antiquities Act, which is, you'll get more about later. Um, this created National Monuments, 1906. Soil Conservation Act, to prevent soil erosion, 1935. Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act, 1937. Uh, 1964, Passage of the Wilderness Act. Uh, 1975, Passage of the Hazardous Material Transportation Act. Toxic Substance Control Act, 1976. Uh, Resource Conservation Recovery, 76, also Passage of Comprehensive Environmental Response and Liability Act, 1980, Superfund Amendments, 1986, Pollution Pre Prevention Act, 1990, Passage of Oil Pollution Prevention Act, and, and these are, this is not a complete list, and you're not expected to know all these, but those are some of the key ones that we start looking at, okay? So let's take a quick look at the EPA because they're a big one these days. Um, originally created in 1970 by President Nixon, they, they replaced what was the Environmental Health Service with a mission statement to protect the environment for our generation and future generations. And you have an EPA that's, that's not too far off. Here in Oregon, we are part of Region 10 of the EPA. Uh, the main office for our region is in Seattle, Washington, but our enforcement office is actually up in Portland. Our state agency is the Department of Environmental Quality, or the DEQ, and this state office is in Portland with a regional office here in Eugene, and you can go to their websites and get more information. Lately, however, we're seeing a rise in anti-environmental sentiment as well as a rise in environmental sentiment. The anti-environmentalist sentiment is fueled largely by industry. It is too expensive to comply with regulations, is what it says and non-compliance leads to heavy fines or imprisonment or both. And because of this, the political atmosphere has shaped a lot of our legislations and they may not be as good at protecting us as we had hoped they were. A candidate who runs on a weak environmental platform brings that lack of attention to the office and is usually backed by those in big industry um, because they're gonna probably have to pay less in fines and taxes. This actually led to what was known as the Sagebrush Revolution, or Sagebrush Rebellion. And it was a movement started in the Western US during the 70s and 80s that sought major changes to federal land control use and disposal policy in 13 Western states where federal land holdings include between 20 and 85% of the state's area. Um, this is not gone. And it, it is of note that when this first started coming around, especially in the late 70s, early 80s, it actually had supporters in pretty high positions. President Ronald Reagan identified with and supported the Sagebrush Rebellion. And most recently, we have the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge that had a, an insurrection and that was documented in the 2018 No Man's Land by David Byers, where you know we, there was a standoff between federal authorities and the armed, heavily armed uh, militia led by the Bundys to go ahead and take back what they saw as theirs. So I have a trailer here um, to go ahead and show you a little bit of the documentary uh, put up by Byers. And so you can take a look at this. And if you're interested, I've made a link to it. It's free for those who have an Amazon Prime membership. Um, so it's in there as an optional thing for after you're done listening. try at least eight people. One person has been out here for many weeks. Uh, there are also other folks who are still here and let, they are let not me show leaving, you they something say. about uh, that. They have been out here. Now, they murdered the innocent man with his hands up like this. Shot him in the chest three times. I know he was unarmed because I'm wearing his pistol. The tyranny becomes low.
then rebellion becomes necessity. Eleven years in the Marine Corps. You deployed us to Iraq. But now, I'm actually out serving my country. The land here needs to be returned to the people. This can't be. The federal government's got to withdraw. Ammon Bundy said that the refuge was an example of federal overreach. And now, they have weapons, and they're making a stand. I do believe they were looking for a confrontation with the federal government. Don't talk to me. Don't be afraid of me. OK, I said be constitutional. All right, that wasn't a twist on their head. This quickly became a stew of right-wing militants. The Malheur Refuge became Exhibit A of that anti-federal fury. So it's day 10 here. We have not seen any kind of law enforcement come in and restrict what these men are doing. Yeah, I think that Oregon made a huge statement by saying this is a white utopia. This is Trump country all day. Cowboys with guns taking over a bird sanctuary in the middle of the desert screaming about American you tyranny. You cannot convince me that federal law enforcement will react the exact same way if you were dealing with some folks who are Black Lives Matter activists. Mr. Obama, this one is for you. No! No! Hold on, hold on. The kind of certitude that, that was professed there it almost demands blood sacrifice to justify itself. Okay, so it's pretty interesting. I've actually watched it. Um, if, if you want some insight into what happened and how people were feeling, uh, it's a good place to go ahead and start. I, I want to kind of leave you today thinking about Earth Day. Earth Day is coming up. and. We, as we go ahead and celebrate it, we want you to think about what it is we're celebrating and how long it's been around. So the first Earth Day actually was April 22nd, 1970. And the idea was for a national day to focus on the environment. And the founder, Gaylord Nelson, a U.S. Senator from Wisconsin, after wish, witnessing the ravages of the 1969 oil spill in Santa Barbara, uh, really put forth the idea and inspired the students and the, inspired by the students in the anti-war movement, he realized that if he could infuse that energy into an emerging public consciousness about air and water pollution, it would force environmental protection to happen and put it onto the national agenda. Um, groups that had been fighting against oil spills, polluting factories, power plants, raw sewage, toxic dumps, pesticides, you name it, suddenly realized that they had shared common values and they came together to work together and made a much bigger uh, protest that all of a sudden was recognized by the political entities as a powerhouse that people cared and wanted something done about this. Okay, here is a picture from the newspaper, this one in the New York Times, uh, talking about millions join Earth Day observances across the nation. It achieved very rare political alignment and listing support of both Republicans and Democrats, rich and poor, city slickers, farmers, tycoons labor leaders, you name it. By the end of that year, the first Earth Day had led to the creation of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, and the passage of the Clean Air, Clean Water, and Endangered Species Act. Uh, it was a gamble, but it paid off. And so, in the 1970s, there was a push to protect the planet, our country's natural resources, but as much as that saw a drive to Earth Day and everything else, there was a backlash against it. In the 1980s, as big business realized that protecting the environment was potentially hurting their profits, uh, corporations, some lawmakers, sought to weaken the environmental laws through disinformation campaigns, kind of propaganda. And there was a call for U.S. to once again take the lead on environmental issues as you get to the end of the 80s because there had been some backsliding. What we have to realize is that natural income is the portion of renewable resources that can be used sustainably. If we overdraw on that bank account, it goes bankrupt. This is the tragedy of the commons. By living only on Earth's natural income and not depleting the natural capital, society moves from an unsustainable lifestyle to a sustainable one, and I think that's the direction we need to head. So given enough time, most degraded environments can recover. Our planet is resilient. But it may take hundreds, even thousands of years to fully recover to the point where it was. And so right now, time is probably our most scarce resource. But 5 to 10% of the population 
changing can actually make a difference and it can change that timetable and it can change how we use resources and it can change what that future looks like. So don't think, oh, I'm just one person, it doesn't matter because it does. And you may lead to one another person doing it and that may lead to another person doing it. And if we can just get that small upswelling, we can have a major impact on how we as a country protect our natural capital. So changes can occur in a shorter time than previously thought if we're willing to make the changes and take the actions to do so. All right, guys, that's what I've got for you. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.